Hello everybody, this is Fernando for the latest Cryptids and Monsters video. Alright, let's go ahead and let's continue the wonderful book, Strange Monsters and Great Searches by George Laycock. This time going into chapter 3. This one having to do not necessarily with a cryptid, but actually a monster, if you could call it that in of itself. It's a real animal, in other words, with a grizzly bear, but a giant grizzly bear. And not only that, apparently one of the deadliest grizzly bears ever encountered there in Colorado. So this book is pretty fascinating because again, not only does it feature the world of cryptids, but also real life animals that fall under unusual categories or strange monsters as the title of the book is in of itself. So I'm going to go ahead and I'll share this chapter here, give my own thoughts and opinions. I was reading a little bit of it ahead of time. It is a pretty frightening chapter. The idea of running into a giant grizzly bear like this with this kind of ferociousness, you definitely don't want to have that happen to you anytime soon. So the title of the chapter is called Old Mose. Let's go ahead and let's feature it here. And I'd love to hear what your own thoughts and comments are on it afterward. So here's what it says. Early in this century, the high mountain country of South Central Colorado was home to a monster with a reputation that sent chills up the spines of strong men. If word went out that old Moe's had been sighted, ranch wives kept their small children indoors, and men were seen to inspect their rifles with special care. All of them knew they were dealing with the biggest grizzly bear ever known in those mountains. They also knew that this bear had tasted human flesh. Under the best conditions, men and grizzly bears have never been very good neighbors. This feud between man and these giant North American bears began when explorers first invaded the bear's habitat. Lewis and Clark, exploring up the Missouri Valley, met the grizzly and were amazed. Then the famous mountain men, Jim Bridger, and all the rest had the grizzly bears for neighbors. Neighborhood relationships never did warm up between the two species. Men despised the grizzlies for killing calves, sheep, and colts, and for threatening people, but they hated the grizzly most for another reason. The giant bears were hard to kill. Sometimes a man would have to shoot a grizzly half a dozen times. Any bear that didn't know when to lie down and die was not to be trusted. These biggest of the bears, known for their humpbacks and disc-shaped faces, or dish-shaped faces, once roamed over most of the western half of the United States. Rifles, traps, and poison took care of that. In the United States today, the grizzly bears are in Yellowstone and Glacier National Parks, and even there, they stay far back in the wilderness, minding their own business most of the time. But even though they are gone from ranch country almost everywhere, stories of them are still repeated. Right in the heart of Olmos's former range lay the Stirrup Ranch. This spread was then owned by Wharton H. Pig, who raised cattle and horses. Mr. Pig was first aware that the giant bear's territory overlapped with his own one day in 1882 when he care upon, came upon the bear's trail. He reined his horse to a halt to gaze at the tracks in amazement. Along this trail had walked a bear with feet bigger than dishpans and one of them a toe that was missing. Then other ranchers and hunters began to sight the monstrous grizzly elsewhere along the mountain range. All agreed that this must be a bear larger than they had ever seen, a frightening monster. This bear obviously deserved a name, and someone called him Old Mose. Indications are that Old Mose might have been young in those days. He lived on for enough years to cause more trouble than anyone really needed. He became a champion at robbing corals. By the size of his foot and that missing toe, ranchers were always able to tell when the giant grizzly had paid a visit. As long as old Mose lived, Mr. Pig pursued him. He learned to understand the bear's habitats. It seems likely that old Mose also learned to understand the schemes dreamed up by Mr. Pig. At any rate, over the years, they periodically tracked each other. Each, perhaps, was aware that a close confrontation would bring both into mortal danger. As the years rolled by, the bear's transgressions increased. He had a fondness for fresh meat. Nobody knows how many head of stock he killed during his lifetime. The records reveal that he killed at least three full-grown bulls. Killing a steer or even a horse was no big thing for old Mose. A single swat with one of those powerful front teeth would send the creature into the hereafter. A slashing bite in the neck would guarantee the job. These crimes were truly bad in ranching country, but old Mose soon earned an even more notorious reputation. 
The bear had been leading the good life in the vicinity of the Black Mountain through the summer and into the fall of 1883. He was a loner, traveling wherever the urge took him. Sometimes he would turn up the sod, seeking tender roots of plants. Other times he would pause to harvest wild berries or snack on grubs. But a body that big needs considerable food, and whenever hunger grew strong enough, Old Mose turned his thoughts of food that came in larger servings. Ranchers found the remains of several cows during those months. Meanwhile, the fame of Old Mose was spreading. There is a rule that guides the destinies of bounty hunters who pursue lawbreakers. The more famous the outlaw, the braver the, seems the man who shoots him. More and more men now dreamed of bringing Old Mose down. So three men set forth one autumn day to seek Old Mose in the high country. One of them was Jake Ratcliffe. Jake fancied himself to be one big bear hunter. For several days, they hunted for sign of the giant grizzly. They watched for restless cattle. They studied the remains of carcasses. They watched for giant footprints. Then, late one afternoon, they found exactly what they were seeking. Old Mose had taken his meal from the carcass of a steer, still warm where it had fallen, and around the kill were the unmistakable prints of the mammoth bear. Various trails led from the spot, and the three men split up to see if one of them could rout the grizzly, and one of them did. The trail followed by Jake Ratcliffe led to the bear-sized hole in the side of a hill. Outside the hole was a mound of fresh earth to tell Jake that a bear had been here shortly before. Jake noticed that he was shaking slightly. A strange chill chased up his spine and he made a conscious effort to control his nerves. Jake had heard no noise and as far as he knew, the breeze had not carried scent of his presence to the bear's sensitive nose. Or perhaps the grizzly had slipped off through the woods unnoticed. This would have been a lucky break for Jake Ratcliffe. Instead, Jake, moving quietly, soon spotted the massive bear. Quickly, he raised his rifle to his shoulder, aimed and fired, and the bullet struck the huge body, but nothing happened. All the bullets that Ratcliffe fired failed to bring the monster to earth. From deep in the massive throat of the grizzly, there came a horrible roar, and then Old Mose turned upon the man. He charged down upon Ratcliffe at full speed. Heavy brush will scarcely slow an enraged bear. Where he wanted to go, the underbrush parted. It was as if a tank were rumbling through. Before Ratcliffe could get his feet in motion, the bear was breathing in his face. And so Old Mose reached for Ratcliffe and threw him in the air like a mouse tossed by a cat. Experienced outdoorsmen know that the best defense when attacked by a bear is to lie perfectly still and hope the bear leaves. Ratcliffe, still conscious, now lay motionless and silent, and Old Mose began to move off. Finally, the mutilated hunter, thinking the bear had gone, lifted his head to inspect the scene, but this was all the clue that Old Mose needed. Filled with pain from the bullets he carried, he had stood off to one side watching and waiting, and now leaped in once more on the man who had hurt him. When the other hunters arrived, they found Ratcliffe still breathing, but old Mose had finished his job. Jake Ratcliffe died before the morning. Now old Mose had really done it. He was guilty of the unforgivable. Word had flashed across Colorado. The state had a killer grizzly on its hands. And every time the, sport, the story was repeated, the bear grew bigger and his exploits more daring. But the giant grizzly had many active years ahead of him. Men tried every trick they could think of to succeed where Jake Ratcliffe had failed. If they set a trap, old Mose would study it. If the trap had somehow been sprung, he would consume the bait before wandering on. But if the trap were still set, he would walk around it, leaving it untouched. Mr. Pig had another idea. He had observed that Old Mose sometimes went to the lake where he splashed and played in cold water. Mr. Pig waited until about time for the old bear to make his rounds over on the mountain again. When Old Mose arrived at the shore of the lake, there hidden in the shallow water was a giant steel trap. The water masked out the man's odor. Old Mose was not thinking of a trap as he splashed into the lake. He had no experience to tell him that there was danger in the water. And then he felt the trap spring. The monstrous bear leaped back and was with his lightning fast reflexes almost escaped the trap completely. But the giant steel jaws had clamped shut on two toes of his right foot. At that moment, the son of a local rancher slipped down to the lake's edge and peered 
through the aspen. When he saw what he saw, sent him flying back to find Mr. Pig. He said, Old Mose is down there, all right. He yelled as he came up to Mr. Pig, right down there in the water, caught in that trap, sure as anything. All men within hearing reached for their guns. The rumble of horses' hooves sounded like a charge of cavalry. At last, they had Old Mose, the killer grizzly. They had him right where they wanted him. That's what they thought. By the time they reached the lake, the massive bear had pulled free of the trap, leaving behind a part of his foot. The old moles went right on killing livestock again. Bears have to eat. If he found the fence between himself and a calf, he might tear down the fence. If he found a colt in a coral, his method was to knock the coral down. Year after year, Mr. Pig and other hunters went into the mountains to test their skill. Some say that after finishing off Jake Ratcliffe, Old Moles killed other men, maybe three or four of them. If a human body was found anywhere within the old bear's range, Old Moles got the credit. One of the newspapers of the day quoted an old-time rancher. The stockmen of this country were in fear of their lives on account of this big bear. There were two or three men that had gone to the hills to look for him. They never returned, and their bodies were never recovered. Finally, J.W. Anthony set out to find Old Mose. Mr. Anthony, who had killed many bears in his lifetime, had a pack of hounds that did his trailing. On April day of 1904, he and Mr. Pig set off together to seek Old Mose. Anthony called upon the bear first. His dogs had surrounded the monster in an aspen grove. Mr. Anthony's mind flashed back to the other bears he had hunted. All were small when compared with the giant that now stood snarling and roaring before him. Then the first bullet struck the bear. Old Mose wheeled about and rushed down upon the hunter, just as he had years earlier upon the hapless Jake Ratcliffe. When Old Mose was only three feet away, Mr. Anthony fired again, and the shot hit the giant right between the eyes. Old Mose suddenly fell and died. All that Old Mose ever wanted was to go where he chose, eat what he liked, and not be hassled. But he belonged to a species for which there was no longer space in the West. And besides, he had a special problem. He was a monster. Men arrived, dragged a huge body back up to Stirrup Ranch. They figured the bear weighed half a ton. The hide was nine feet, four inches long, and nine and a half feet wide. One scientist, who later studied the brain of Old Mose, concluded that the size of his brain was not very big, considering the bulk of his body. But for more than 20 years, the giant bear had been a match for every man who had pursued him. Then that's it. That's everything associated with this chapter. Chapter 3, titled Old Mose, there in the book Strange Monsters and Great Searches. So let's talk about that here. Great chapter, right? Again, this didn't have to do necessarily with the world of cryptids, but it definitely had to do with an oversized bear, a deadly bear at that. Although overall, whenever I was finishing the chapter, I almost got a sense of tragedy when it comes to Old Mose. The author rightly summed it up at the end. He was just a normal bear. He was just trying to live his life basically in solidarity wherever he went and then eat whatever he wanted, but again, trying his best to stay away from people, if but for the fact that people started to move into his area. And so when that happened, there was that fateful encounter between him and Mr. Pig that um, that seemed to start everything on there. There he was killing a lot of the calves, the sheep, the colts, and so on, and Mr. Pig wasn't having it, and so he began his pursuit, and then that ended up eventually bringing others into this hunt, and then that ended up having Old Mose eventually meet his fate with one guy by the name of Mr. Anthony. But before that, Old Mose ran into another guy named Jake Ratcliffe, and then he ended up killing him. Not once, not because necessarily it seemed like it was out of vendetta or vengeance or anything like that, but again, it was almost in the form. It's kind of tragic in the form of self-defense. He was being hunted. He got shot at. The bear did. And then when that happened, he even almost let Mr. Ratcliffe go. And when, it, when Mr. Ratcliffe played, quote-unquote, dead, just lying still. But then he had to move back up. And then that's when it caused uh, Old Mose to try to finish the job afterward. But overall, again, just a, it's, it's a tragic story. But still, you're dealing with something involving a gigantic bear being in the wrong place at the wrong time, having this type of situation with many of the settlers and the ranchers there, 
And then people, as the chapter uh, highlighted, spreading stories that grew wilder and wilder to the notion that anyone that encountered something or was missing afterward was then attributed to old Mose, even if he didn't have anything to do with, uh, uh, with what caused that person's demise or disappearance or anything along those lines again it's just this bear just trying to live its own life and then running into these people who were trying to constantly pursue them the fascinating thing though was apparently the intelligence associated with old Mose. another unique trait how many times have you ever heard of bears doing something like that right being able to not only spot traps but also avoid them walk around them not obviously spring them and if they're sprung then just eating whatever is associated with that trap and then being able to leave without being caught the idea that missed uh, that this old mose had a toe missing from before made me wonder if he was in turn caught in another trap and then learned from that uh, losing a toe in the process but then learning from that experience and then that way he was able to i guess be out there as the author mentioned about 20 years successfully out there trying to evade people while still hunting for food as it naturally does and then eventually sadly you know meeting its own demise afterward but otherwise let me know what you guys and gals think about this unique tale a giant quote-unquote monster a bear called miss uh, called old Mose, and then the time period that he had there in colorado that frightened a lot of people there too but let me know what you guys and gals think all right everybody thanks again as always take care